Um, we are ready to start, I think. Bishop Darcy, are you ready? Yes. Okay, so let me repeat the question. Yep. Um, the first question is, from the perspective of your faith, what is your belief of the afterlife? Okay. Thank you. Can everyone hear all right? Very important. I thank Ramona and I thank Canterbury School, and I'm honored to be uh, part of such a distinguished panel. The very fact that everyone here has something to say about this indicates that the hunger in every person for, for eternal life, that death can be o overcome, that is universal. That hunger to keep on living. Life is such a precious gift. We, with gr great reluctance, give it up. So wh where does that come from? I think that's from our Creator. And eternal life for us is not some life out in the universe. Heaven is where God is. What heaven means for a Catholic, for a Christian, is that God will not abandon us at the time of death or after death, and that he has prepared a place for us. Now, we don't make these things up. We're a revealed religion revealed by God in the, in the Old Testament, the Hebrew scriptures, as the Jewish people call them. We have some signs, however dim, of belief in eternal life. The Sadducees at the time of Christ did not believe in the final resurrection. The Pharisees did. So there was an inclination there. And the Psalms are full of hope for eternal life. But Jesus Christ promised it. Sin, death came, not from God. In fact, it says in the scriptures, God did not make death. Death came about by the sin of man, tempted by Satan. And God immediately promised a redeemer who would over, overcome what was, what was the cause, would overcome sin, and would prepare us for eternal life. <laughs> the original sin was, you will be like God. You will know good and evil. Arrogance would say today that that idea of you will know good and evil, you, you will decide who lives and dies, is still present, whether in a skyscraper in a beautiful Sunday morning or in the life of the, uh, in the uh, womb of the mother. Some people still think we can take life and, and, and do things which are sinful. But Jesus Christ came to, to overcome all this, and he promised eternal life. So we don't just make it up. And it is with it, eternal life to be in heaven is to be with God and it, it's, a, it's the loss of sin, the overcoming of sin. It's every tear being wiped away, and it is a, a, an eternal life forever. We also believe in the resurrection of the body. We say that when we recite the creed every Sunday. When we die, our soul is separated from the body, and the soul is, re receives a particular judgment, and that's uh, also in the scriptures. So our belief in heaven is not based on evidence, but based on the word of God. It's based on faith. And to touch on the second question for a moment, how do we assure ourselves of eternal life? It's, it's when we live by faith in the Son of God, in Jesus Christ. Now this is a particular week for Christians because we have just celebrated the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And that, for us, is the, is the great promise of eternal life. St. Paul, in speaking of it, speaks about our resurrection, and he said, if, if, if Jesus Christ is not risen, then we will not rise. And, and, but if, if Christ is not risen, we are the most abject of men. And we, we read about the, the accounts of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. They are varied. And, and there's very much anxiety and confusion. How can this be? The way to Emmaus, which we read in the Gospel today, is, is uh, the two men walking away from Jerusalem, uh, dejected. Everything is lost. 
Jesus of Nazareth has, been, has, has died. The man who comes along, the wayfarer, as John Paul calls him, explains it was necessary for the Christ to have suffered these things and so enter into his glory. So the cross and, and the death of Christ for our salvation has um, opened heaven. In, in his, and so we believe that heaven is a place with God, it's a place of eternity, and... Before you... <coughs> the pardon? Let me cut you off. Is Am I right? finished? Okay. Right. Sorry. I shouldn't have had you go first, should I have? Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> that's fine. Is that fine? Okay. okay. You got five minutes and a little bit. I have more? No, not now. Okay. <laughs> I'm a preacher. I go on <laughs> All right, we will move down to this end, Dr. Nering. <laughs> I'm very happy to be here. Thanks to Ramona Fisher to speak to you about afterlife from the perspective of Hindu religion. The doctrine of reincarnation or rebirth or transmigration of soul is the very bedrock of uh, Hinduism and also of other religions of the East, such as Buddhism and Sikhism. I will speak to you on afterlife through a series of eight questions and answers. Question one, who is God? God or the supreme soul, supreme consciousness or Brahman is the creator and the substance of all creation, both living and non-living. He is not only the basis of the universe and the living beings, but he transcends them as well. Two, who are we? We are the eternal soul or consciousness that is a reflection of the supreme soul. We are not this physical body. We are spiritual beings on human journey and are not human beings on a spiritual journey. Krishna says in Gita 2.22, just as a person gives up old clothes and takes up new ones, so does the soul, the one who dwells in the body, gives up old bodies and takes others which are new. Three, who is this soul? Gita 2.20 says, the soul is never born, nor does it die. It is not that, having been, it ceases to exist again. It is unborn, eternal, undergoes no change whatsoever, and it is ever new. When the body is destroyed, the soul is not destroyed. Four, why we have the body? Here we have the law of karma. It is the scientific principle of action and reaction. As we sow, so shall we reap. Virtuous actions will give us good results. Evil or vicious actions will give us suffering. The human soul has been impure over many past lives, including this life, because the desires and aversions of the mind through cravings of greed, lust, power, and pride Impure souls are compelled by the law of karma to continue in the cycle of birth and death. Fortunately, the human body is the only avenue available to the soul by which it can become free from the birth and death cycle and achieve the purpose of human life. Five, what is the purpose of human life? The purpose of human life is to inquire into the absolute truth and achieve self-realization or God-realization. To understand that I am the eternal soul, whose father, mother, and all is the supreme soul. As long as we are body conscious, we will remain in the cycle of endless births and deaths. Six, what happens if we have done good or bad deeds? People who do good deeds with the desire to receive good results go to heaven. But going to heaven is like uh, a visit to Hawaii. <laughs> They go to heaven with the bank balance of good deeds. When the balance is zero, they have to come back to the routine cycle of life. Gita 9.21 says, having enjoyed the vast world of heaven, they return to the world of mortals on the completion of their merits. But desiring objects of desires, they go and come. Those who conduct has been bad, obtain lower forms of birth such as that of animals or insects, which is same as living in a hell. People return from hell as well after their account of bad deeds is settled. Seven, is grieving recommended at the time of death? Gita 2.13 strongly suggests that we should not grieve at the time of death. 
it says just as for the soul in this body there is childhood youth and old age similar is the gaining of another body with reference to that a wise person does not come to grief eight what happens at the time of death on death of the physical body of a human who has not reached self realization the departure of the soul is accompanied by the subtle body that has the subtle impressions elements and tendencies of the mind and senses which are the seeds for the new body the subtle body is the software for the new hardware the body it is going to acquire this explains why some are born as geniuses from a young age to conclude gita 8.6 says whatever state of being one remembers when he leaves his body that state of being he will attain in his next life the last thought which is the culmination of all thoughts of his life lifetime will determine his destiny he will be born again to fulfill that destiny thank you um, Scott Majors will be speaking next, and um, we have a Baha'i family at our school, and a Baha'i faith was not one that I'm particularly very familiar with, and it's been wonderful to have them um, in our interfaith group, and so I'm excited to have Scott here with us tonight. So, Thank, Scott. You. Thank you very much. <coughs> Excuse me, I am, I am a little hoarse this evening, so bear with me. Um, I, I would also like to thank you, because I think you've done uh, the community a great service by bringing all these people thank together you. to uh, speak of faith, and it's wonderful to see so many people here uh, with, with a unified interest. So thank you. Thank you. Um, for, for me, the, uh, the concept of, of eternal damnation as created by a loving creator has always been uh, a difficult one to, uh, to, to make sense of. Um, and, and I assume that, that God loves his children every, as much, every bit as much as I, I love my own. And so it, it's particularly difficult to imagine that I could turn to one of my children and say, you know, you've done well. You've reach the achievements I had hoped for and you get to go to heaven and then turn to another one and say, well, you, you came close, you really tried hard, but I'm, I'm sorry, you're going to have to go to hell. And so um, it, it just, it doesn't seem to be an opportunity to learn from the mistakes that we've made. So I, I wonder, you know, is, is God more concerned with what we have done in the past than our potential in the future, especially when we weigh our relatively short life here on this plane with an eternal future. So, and, and you know, if I, if I were judged solely by everything I completed by, say, high school, I probably wouldn't be here today, so um, I'm, I'm hoping. Um, so uh, this world operates with a fair amount of complexity, and uh, it would stand to reason that the afterlife is, afterlife is equally complex. Um, and, and again, we, as, as I mentioned earlier, you know, we've got about 70 to 80 years on this life, and uh, an eternity afterwards, potentially. So, um, yeah, if, uh, what I have written here is if it were all just harps and hymns, I think we'd get a bit bored. And uh, I think uh, perhaps there's, there's something more. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna reference uh, uh, three major figures in the Baha'i Faith. One is Baha'u'llah, he's the founder of the Baha'i Faith. Uh, the second one is Abdul Baha. He is the, the son of Baha'u'llah. And then finally, I'll reference uh, Shoghi Effendi, who was the grandson of Baha'u'llah. Um, Baha'u'llah says regarding the soul, know thou of a truth that the soul, after its separation from the body, will continue to, to progress until it attaineth the presence of God in a state and condition which neither the revolution of ages or centuries nor the changes and chances of the world can alter. It will endure as long as the kingdom of God, his sovereignty, his dominion, and power will endure. Baha'u'llah goes on to say, as to thy question concerning the worlds of God, know thou of a truth that the worlds of God are countless in their number, infinite in their range. None can reckon or comprehend them except God, the all-knowing, the all-wise. Baha'u'llah said that in reference to a question that was asked by a believer. Shubhi Effendi also wrote a letter to a believer saying, the nature of the soul after death can never be described, nor is it meet and permissible to reveal its whole character to the eyes of men. The prophets and messengers of God have been sent down for the sole purpose of guiding mankind to the straight path of truth. The purpose underlying their revelation hath been to educate all men 
that they may at the hour of death ascend in the utmost purity and sanctity with the absolute detachment to the throne of the Most High. The light which these souls radiate, this is interesting to me, the light which these souls radiate is responsible for the progress of the world and the advancement of its peoples. So this to me sounds like we have a job to do in the afterlife. And, and there are passages in the Baha'i writings which allude to the notion that the kingdom of God and all the inhabitants therein are around us at all times, working on our behalf. However, due to our limited capacity in our human condition, uh, we are ignorant of their presence. So Shoghi Effendi talks a little bit about that. You ask an explanation of what happens to us after we leave this world. This is a question which none of the prophets have ever answered in detail for the very simple reason that you cannot convey to one person's mind something entirely different from everything they have ever experienced. Abdu'l-Bahá gave a wonderful example of the realm, uh, I'm sorry, of the relation of this life to the next life being like the, like the child in the womb. The child in the womb. It develops eyes, ears, feet, and tongue, and yet it has nothing to see or hear. It cannot wasp, walk or grasp things or speak. All these faculties it is developing for this world. If you tried to explain to an embryo what this world is like, it could never understand it. But it understands when it is born and the faculties can be used. So we cannot picture our state in the next world. All we know is that our consciousness, our personality, endures in some new state, and that that world is as much better than this one is better than the womb of our mothers. Thank you. All right, Pastor Hawks. Well, thank you very much uh, to Ramona, to Canterbury Schools, to all of you, and I've already learned so much, so thank you fellow panelists for uh, educating all of us tonight. Uh, I'm a Christian, as is uh, Bishop Darcy, so I can say amen to everything that uh, he said, uh, uh, but uh, it's an occupational hazard. I'll keep talking anyway. Uh, this is a really perfect timing, Ramona. Uh, none of us would have known that when this was scheduled months ago that the cover of Time magazine this past week was on the subject of heaven and hell, particularly the subject of hell. And here we are tonight talking about the afterlife. I think that tells us how important that topic is to have one of our nation's major secular magazine put that on the cover. When you think of all the things that they could have put on the cover, you know, our Congress was threatening to shut down the government. Uh, Christie Alley had fallen in Dancing with the Stars. I mean, there are a lot of issues out there at the time, and tonight's issue was what they published. Uh, is there life after death, and what happens to us? As a Christian, we believe that there is life after death. But I, for one, don't particularly like that distinction, life after death. It seems to take, there's this life and there's that life. There's now and there's then, as though there's this, this dichotomy between the two. Uh, Jesus constantly talked about the kingdom of heaven as a present reality. And so while we believe that there is a real place called heaven, we believe that that life starts in this life, and this life really matters. Uh, too often, I think, Christianity has viewed heaven as out there when we get there and, and makes this life seem almost as though it's just a test. Uh, this life really does matter to God. And in our concept of heaven, as we read about it in the Bible, and Bishop Darcy referenced this, there's going to be a resurrection. God's going to bring back even our dead bodies. And that sounds so uh, incomprehensible, so illogical when we think of what happens to a body and when it goes through the ultimate decay process. Uh, we kind of scientifically looked at that and said, that, that's absurd. And now we have wonderful confirmation of science that makes us go, oh, maybe there's more to what God has said than we gave credit. And we just finished within the last decade the Human Genome Project, and what we found out is you and I are made up not only of energy and matter, but we're made up of information. Uh, we call that DNA. 
And there are billions and billions of bits of information in every cell. And so the question has always been, how could this be reconstructed? Well, I believe that God knows me by name, and he knows me by need. And he knows you right down to the number of hairs covering your head. Now, that's becoming less of a challenge for God as I approach to 60. But God knows us down to the detail. He's got your DNA memorized. He knows you better than you know yourself, and then he can by the power of his word, as he created the world originally, he can recreate and he can resurrect. So our life in this life today is to know God through faith in Jesus Christ and begin a life that's connected to God today and one that will last for all of eternity. Uh, heaven is all of the things that we hear with the, the images. Uh, streets of gold, gates of pearl. Good. Uh, that's, that's nice. But heaven is really knowing God. I've been privileged to be married to my wife for 34 years, all of them good years. And if you gave me the choice between living in, in uh, Michigan, uh, where it, it's winter way too long for me, with my wife Kathy, or living in Hawaii, which I loved when we visited there. Without my wife, Kathy, I want to be in Michigan with her. She is the joy of my life. Where she is, is where I want to be. And on a far greater scale, where God is, that's where we want to be. And so more than anything else, heaven is being with God, and it starts today. I start in the name of God, the most merciful, the most kind. Uh, I greet you all with the Islamic greetings of Assalamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuhu. Means, may peace, blessings, and mercy of God be on all of us. All the quotes that I'm going to make today are from the Holy Quran. Whatever I'm presenting, the truth is from God, and whatever is inaccurate is from me. So help me, God. <laughs> Islam is a word that comes from Salam, which means peace and submission. Hence, a Muslim is one who submits to the will of God to attain peace, peace for himself and for others. Before I mention about afterlife, let us talk about life. In Islam, the concept of life is very simple. There is a creator, whether you call him God, Allah, Yahweh, Yehovah, Elah, or Ishwar. He is the master, the sustainer, the provider, the planner, who provides for us and in return demands absolute allegiance and worship. And we, have his, we are his creation. This life is a gift to us from him, and he expects us to care for it well. This life may be a day or a hundred years, and he expects us to fulfill his commands during this lifetime. If we do well in this life according to his commands, he has promised us that he'll take care of us later. That is, after this life in another life, when we'll be resurrected to a life of eternal abode. Life in this world is a drop in the ocean, and the afterlife is the ocean. Depending on our deeds in this world, we can either go to heaven or hell after we are assessed on the day of judgment. Chapter 99, verse 6 to 8 says, God says that that day mankind will proceed in scattered groups, that they will be shown their deeds. So whosoever does good equal to the weight of an atom shall see it, and whosoever does evil equal to the weight of atom shall see it. Chapter 101, six, verses 6 to 11. Then as for him whose balance of good deeds will be heavy, he will live a pleasant life in paradise. As for him whose balance of good deeds will be light, his home is hell. Chapter 3, verse 185. Every soul shall taste death, and only on the day of resurrection shall you be paid your wages in full. And whoever is removed away from the fire and admitted to paradise, 
he indeed is successful. The life of this world is but comfort of illusion. Chapter 79, verse 37 to 41. Then for him who transgressed all bounds and preferred the life of this world by following his evil desires and lusts, verily his abode will be hellfire. As for him who feared standing before his Lord and restrained himself from impure evil desires and lusts, verily paradise will be his abode. Chapter 88, verse 2 to 16. Some faces on their day will be humiliated, laboring and weary. They will enter in the hot blazing fire. They'll be given to drink from a boiling spring. No food will be there for them but a poisonous thorny plant which will neither nourish nor avail their hunger. Other faces, that day will be joyful, glad with their endeavor for the good deeds they did in this world along with their faith in God. In a lofty paradise where there shall be no harmful speech or falsehood. There'll be running springs, thrones raised high, cups set at hand, cushions set in rows, and rich carpets all spread out. Chapter 36, verse 55 to 58. Verily, the dwellers of paradise that day will be busy with joyful things. They and their spouses will be in pleasant shade reclining on thrones. They will have therein fruits of all kinds and all that they desire. It will be said to them, Salam, peace be on you. A word from their Lord, the most merciful.